Hello everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Gaming in the Wild, a video games podcast about games from the artistic, creative, and often independently produced side of the spectrum. My name's John, I'm your host, I'm a journalist who lives in Reykjavik, Iceland, where today I had a royal visit. Just as I was preparing for the podcast, um, a neighbourhood cat came, came into the flat, I had the front door open. It leads into the back garden. Um, and this cat is kind of a local celebrity. She's called Ophelia. She has long grey hair. It's kind of ombre. So it fades from like light grey to dark grey. And she has bright blue eyes. And she is just the most beautiful, elegant cat. And she's a bit of a local celebrity around here. I think a lot of tourists uh, take pictures of her because she's on the main street. I live on the main street. Uh, Reykjavik, Skolvodstiga. Um And sometimes she comes into the house and today she came in, sat in the sink, because she's a weirdo, and waited for me to turn on the tap for a drink and then hung out for a little bit, some stroking and was purring. Often she just comes in and out for a drink of water. Running water only, will not accept bowl water because she's a princess Ophelia. So that was my celebrity visit of the day. But enough about cats, it's a games podcast after all. And today I'm going to talk about four different games. The music that we're listening to now is from the first one. It's a brand new indie visual novel about family and driving and food called Road to Guangdong. The second game is also about food and cooking, but it's very different. It's called Battle Chef Brigade. I've talked about it a little bit before, but I finished it recently, so I'll be talking about that game too. And then a couple of smaller games that I played. Uh, one of them is another visual novel style game that I just found in my random games folder of stuff that I download from Itch or Steam or whatever. So I just have, always have a folder of games on my Mac and sometimes if I'm just sitting up at night or whatever, I'll just open up a random game. Often I forgot how I came by it, as was the case with this one. It may have been in the Itch um, bundle for racial justice. I downloaded probably 20 games from that, but I just throw stuff in there and this one's called far from noise and then finally um i got a nice uh, twitter message from a developer called mythic owl and they made a switch game called one line coloring a very simple game that i opened up for the first time and found myself getting a little bit lost in so that's four games in one podcast um the first game is the new one that just came out it's called road to guangdong Road to Guangdong is an indie game that came out this year. It's by a developer called Just Add Oil. And it was published by Excalibur, who also did Jalopy, to which it has a little bit of uh, similarity, if you know that game. The music is by Chris Randall, and I've been very taken with the music of this game. Um, As you can tell, I normally leave like 10 or 15 seconds of music, but the music for this game is so striking and, and wonderful. I just left it running for a while there. Um, And it does add an awful lot to the game. It's a game about a family. You're called Sunny, and you're a girl who has just um, inherited a restaurant after your parents died in an accident. So you come to Guangdong and meet your aunt called Guma, which is the Chinese name for an aunt, I think a maternal aunt. And people often refer to each other by their family names in this game, the Chinese family names or Cantonese family names. So your aunt's called Guma, her name's actually Grace. You refer to your father and mother as Baba and Mama. You are referred to as Che Che at some point by a a younger relative, meaning big sister. Your grandfather is called Gung Gung. Um, And so it's really interesting to to learn all of these family names in Chinese. Uh, The game is written by an author called Yen Ui. It says on her wiki that she's um, studying 
at the University of London, Royal Holloway, focused on science fiction and Chinese science fiction. But she did a, a great job on this game. And with this music and the visuals of the game, and the kind of familial uh, dialogue of the game, gives it a really nice, uh, authentic feel. It reminded me a little of um, early Ang Lee movies. Um, I don't know if, if you guys have seen them, but like he made a trilogy of movies before he went to Hollywood and became a big star and did like The Incredible Hulk and Sense and Sensibility and The Ice Storm and all those big movies. But before that, he did three movies in his native uh, Taiwanese about family. They were called Eat, Drink, Man, Woman, Pushing Hands and The Wedding Banquet. And I absolutely love those movies because they give you a really beautiful, rich uh, insight into how families work in Taiwan. And I got a similar feeling about uh, Cantonese or Chinese families in this game. So Sunny has um, inherited the restaurant and Gu Ma tells her that they're going to go on a road trip to visit all of the um, other members of the family who are dotted around uh, different regions surrounding Guangdong. And they're going to go and invite them all to um, a family reunion and just to kind of touch base with them, talk about the restaurant, make sure they're all kind of happy and kind of share some commiserations about the accident with Sunny. And so Gumar gives you the keys to Sandy, which is your parents' very old, very worn car. And off you go on a road trip. Um, you can choose in which order you go and visit the five different um, houses that you'll be going to in the game. Um, I first went to Dongguang in Hong Kong. Um, and there, there is like a, each, each place gives you a different sort of family unit, whether it's cousins or aunties or brothers or whatever. And each of them has different problems going on in their lives. And so you come to visit them all. You learn a little bit about their lives, whether they're living on a farm and they need some help. Uh, with the a kid, looking after a kid, which um, Sonny does, or um, one of them needs a letter translated from English to uh, Chinese so that you can understand what it's about, and that contains some sort of uh, important family information that you then have to impart. Um, in Foshan, you have an uncle running a dojo, and he's having problems there. And so you travel from place to place, and you uh, talk to your relatives, and you help them solve little problems. But uh, the gameplay mechanic is that, first of all, you have to get there. So it's a very lo-fi driving game. Um, you get into the car, you can fill up the gas, you can open the bonnet and you can replace the oil filter and air filter. Um, and then you drive. And all you can do to drive really is fire the ignition and then the R2 button is accelerate. Uh, L2 is brake and then reverse if you crash. Um, but that's kind of it, really lo-fi. You have to drive for probably five minutes between places or 10 minutes. And along the way, there are gas stations where you can pull over and fill up the oil and fix whatever's wrong with the car. And a lot goes wrong with it. It's a very old car. And so you're just kind of driving through this kind of beautiful um, countryside and cities and towns with a different architecture. And like you'll go through fields and you'll go through busy urban areas. And then you'll go through these more kind of provincial town areas. And eventually, after kind of wrangling the car, you'll get, get to your destination and meet your next relative. And it's it's kind of meditative. There's not a lot to worry about. The car can't go too fast, otherwise the fan belt starts to scream and there's like a coolant light that comes on and your um, guma will tell you off for driving too fast. Uh, there's a radio with two stations, one of which has modern music, which has like a kind of garage rock track that sounds like the hives and a, a dance track that sounds like the prodigy. And then there's a more traditional uh, station, which has a di three different tracks, like the ones we just listened to. Um, there's only, I think, six songs that you'll, you'll be listening to a lot on your travels. But um, the music gave a really nice dimension. So you're just kind of cruising through the countryside. It's kind of simply rendered, uh, low poly countryside. And then you're dealing with these kind of visual novel style family encounters. And I discovered on the, the first one went really well. And um, at the end of each encounter, you ask the relatives to come to the reunion, which is the ultimate end of the game at the restaurant. Um, and I discovered on the second one that you can go wrong. Like I kind of made a choice um, to hide a chicken that was supposed to be slaughtered, but that this kid really loved. So I hid the chicken and slaughtered a different one. It turned out to be the wrong choice. The family was not happy with my decision. 
and they didn't come to the reunion, but everyone else did. So the choices that you make do matter in this game. Um, but each encounter is really kind of uh, nice. Each one gives you a different insight into family relationships, kind of older, prideful relatives, younger, modern couples that are worried about things that modern couples worry about, you know, just money and getting time together and children and this kind of stuff. And then older relatives that have maybe lost a spouse that are wondering about that kind of third act of their lives. And it's all really nicely written. Um, I really enjoyed the game. It took about five hours to complete. I did it in a single sitting, although I did break halfway through the game because um, I forgot to mention that each time you successfully talk to a relative, you'll get um, a secret family recipe that you can then cook in the restaurant. And it was making me hungry, so I stopped and cooked myself some knife-cut noodles and uh, stir-fried tofu and vegetables and ate that and then finished the game. So be warned that this game might make you hungry. But that's a really nice indie game. Just come out. It's on Switch, Xbox, and Steam, and PS4. Um, I'm going to be reviewing this game for Switch Indie Fix. It's a great Switch website. You can follow Adam, the editor, on uh, Twitter at Switch Indie Fix and on Twitch. So look out for my review there. That's Road to Guangdong. The second game I'm going to talk about today is another game that uh, heavily features cooking. Kind of a coincidence. I mean, it's also about Chinese cooking, although a very fantastical version of it. It's called Battle Chef Brigade. It was made in 2017 by Trinket Studios and published by Adult Swim. And in this game, um, the Battle Chef Brigade is a, a fantastical unit of warrior chefs who are kind of the champions of a country called Victusia. Um, and you play Mina. She's a chef in a family restaurant in a, a small village called Windy Village. And she works in the kitchen. And this includes going out into the, the backyard of the restaurant to hunt down um, animals and pick plants using an array of kind of uh, moves with her knives. Um, she can swipe down fruit and she can do uppercuts and even cast magic like a whirlwind to catch birds that then fall down and she collects the bird legs and stuff and she runs into the kitchen and when she's in the kitchen um, each ingredient that she's collected has different elements whether it's blue for water green for earth or red for fiery and you can combine the different ingredients into a pot where you have to do a match three puzzle game so you can like join together three blues and they'll turn into a more powerful blue gem and if you combine three more powerful blue gems, then you'll get like the ultimate powerful flavor of water. And the same goes for green and red. But Mina's ambitions lie far from Windy Village. She wants to go and join the Battle Chef Brigade. And so off she goes to the capital to take part in the proving ceremony with chefs from around the country, which includes different cool characters like uh, an orc called Thrash, who wants to bring fusion orc cuisine to all of Victusia, and a kind of a weird um, necromancer guy and kind of elven guys and it's just a really diverse cool cast um, it's all voice acted and the visual style is incredibly fresh it's a uh, hand-drawn and animated in a kind of um, anime style and watercolored um, and the whole thing just looks beautifully bright and crisp and fresh and uh, cool it's like an anime movie that you can take part in so you have these kind of visual novel style segments where you talk to people um, discover information there are different dramas that go on during the proving ceremony just imagine any sort of coming of age champion movie you know there are ups and downs and injustices and uh, schemes and competitors and all this kind of stuff um, and when you get to the capital you stay in a and b in a beautifully painted room um, and then you can come downstairs and you can help out a scientist called Belchior uh, by doing some uh, match three puzzles for him. He's trying to make a magical ambrosia that accentuates flavours. Then you can go hunting um, and to do that you talk to an instructor called Thorn. And she's really cool. She has like a kind of a villainous English accent and she's really gothy 
And she's just like this deadly huntress who takes you out and teaches you different hunting techniques. Then there's a restaurant um, with a chef called Pontida, who has this kind of crazy Norwegian uh, accented English. And Pontida puts you to work and you have to kind of speed make different dishes as the orders come in. And then after you've completed your tasks for the day, you can buy different items from the store, such as different pots or different ingredients that you'll have in your shelves at the start of each contest. And then you compete. And the competition is, it's much like the kitchen at home, but um, rather than the family kitchen, you're cooking on a, a big stage with judges who demand different dishes from you. You have to run out of the door and go and hunt down your ingredients, run in, and then match three to the best of your ability. It gets more complex as the game goes on. There are kind of toxic elements and some ingredients that you have to chop out. But to do that, you have to get a chopping board. And then you can get like uh, different sources that will change the colours of gems, this kind of thing. And you just have to face off against different cooks. And the dishes that happen come kind of automatically. So you just match three as much as you can. Say that the chef wants a fiery dish. So you just use as much red stuff as you can. You use sun hat tomatoes. Maybe you have to fight a dragon, like the most powerful enemy in the game. And if you can manage to take down the dragon, you get uh, powerful little gems in your dragon shanks that are fiery also. And you whip it all up, match three as much as you can, and then serve your dish. And although you have very little control over what dishes actually come out, they're really cool. Like, say, you'll get like a dragon shank stroganoff, and it looks beautiful with this kind of fiery steam coming out of it and meat falling off the bone and sun hat tomato garnish. And there's a definite Sichuan and Western Chinese influence in the dishes that come out. Like you'll get king beans, uh, flat noodles, and you'll be able to make like um, baoron, uh, mapo tofu. And so there's a, different, a definite kind of spicy Chinese food um, aesthetic going on there. Uh, as well as some comedy ones, like there's a blood pizza. That's just the most unappetizing thing in the world. And you can also like cook with uh, slime and different monster parts. All of the creatures that you kill are kind of um, monster versions. So the Balron is like a giant bull, and there's like a fiery uh, looper, lupin, uh, lupir rather, dog creature that you can kill for an extra fiery ingredient. Blue slime eggs and all this kind of crazy stuff. So you get to feel like a genius chef just by doing some brawler gameplay and some match three stuff. And then on you go. There are six chapters to the game, including the intro when you're working at the family restaurant, and then the introductory rounds where you learn the mechanics and get used to the competition in the city game. I think it took me about 10 hours to complete the whole thing, but it's so episodic that you can play it in small bursts. Really nice kind of uh, jolly game. I was playing it before bed a little bit instead of reading. You know, it's the kind of game a little bit like coffee talk that you can kind of just relax with a little bit and I really can't compliment the visual style enough um, the the fresh watercolored palette is just so um, beautiful it's, it's a wonderful game to play really really enjoyable really enjoyed that one um, I want to say thank you to fine as fool on Twitter um, that's fine p h i n e so please follow fine as fool he recommended this game to me in my um, epic Twitter thread about games that people feel are underrated. Battle Chef Brigade was actually nominated by several people, but um, Fine as Fool is uh, someone that I really trust with the recommendations. He knows his games. So I got this one on the Switch East store. I think I paid £20 for it, but it's the kind of thing that you could put on your wish list and wait for a sale. It will come up, no doubt. It's um, kind of an acclaimed game, but it's true that it is also kind of a, a hidden gem. I encourage people to check that one out. Um, it's also available on PS4 and uh, other platforms, but it was really nice to play handheld on Switch. It was uh, flawless, uh, flawlessly produced. It ran perfectly. Looks beautiful, sounds beautiful. Great game. That's Battle Chef Brigade. Uh, 
the next game I'm going to talk about is one of those uh, Mac folder oddities that I mentioned in the intro. It's a game by George Batchelor. It came out in 2017 on PS4, iOS, Mac and PC. It's called Far From Noise. It has a really nice soundtrack um, by Jeff Lentin, which we're listening to now. Uh, you get the whole thing on Bandcamp if you like it. It's some orchestral stuff and some electronic stuff. But this game is a pure visual novel. Um, most of the game happens in one shot. So you're looking out to sea from a cliff and there is a car, like a, an old sort of um, 2 CV looking thing or like a, a VW Beetle style old fashioned car and it's just stuck on the cliff edge, precipitously swaying. And you are someone who is inside this car and you are uh, having a meltdown about it. So um, you're looking at this car swaying. You can see uh, the birds flying out at the sea. You can see the twinkling water and the wind blowing in the trees. And you're in the car and you begin talking to yourself. There's a dialogue tree a little like um, Oxenfree, if you've played that one, or After Party. So you get three different options. And if you have your finger on the, the arrow buttons on your PC or your Mac, you push left, up or down. And that's basically all you can do in the whole game is select a, a dialogue option. So you can choose whether you're going to panic. You can choose whether you're going to be philosophical. So you can kind of guide the personality of the character a little bit. It's about a two hour game. And during the course of the game, um, you'll learn a lot about the character. You'll learn why she is um, out here at the cliffs. You'll learn what she's uh, running from and what she's hoping for and this kind of thing. And you'll do so partly because there is a second character in the game, um, which is a deer. And the deer, within the first couple of minutes of the game, so it's not a big spoiler, walks up to the car, says hello, and after saying, excuse me, are you a talking deer? Yes. Then you'll start a conversation with this deer who will regale you with these kind of um, philosophies and advice and occasionally bits of poetry that will kind of appear in the sky um, as the, the deer does a kind of a recital. And so um, I kind of enjoyed this one. Um, it's not like a, a, a home run of a game. It's like uh, you have to be ready for the fact that there's not a lot of gameplay here. It's a little more like watching a play with um, a very light interactive element in that you can choose dialogue. Uh, and there's not much more to it than that. So it's two hours of kind of um, philosophical chat. Um, the, the one downside I have of this game is that your character um, is a bit annoying. Um, so the deer is saying these kind of profound things about life and sometimes the only response that is available to you is to make a wisecrack um, not awfully well written sometimes. You get the feeling that um, George or whoever wrote this female character um, didn't nail it in the same way as the writers of Oxenfree or Night in the Woods or A Short Hike, for example, where there's kind of believable teens who make actual funny jokes. Yours is just a little trite sometimes. And so I felt kind of annoyed to have to choose any of the dialogue options because none of them are things that I would want to say. Um, but that was the one downside of it. Some of the dialogue wasn't quite there for me. Um, but it was an enjoyable game. I wanted to flag it up. It's, um, I think it's available for free on Itch. Um, really enjoyed the music. It's meditative. It's a very chill time. So if you want to spend two hours just kind of watching this, this uh, ambient play unfold before your eyes, then I recommend Far From Noise. And the last game I'm going to talk about today is called One Line Colouring. Um, and the, the dev of this game, Mythic Owl, um, got in touch with me on Twitter and offered me a download code for the game, which I really appreciate. Uh, it's a pretty simple game. Um, and when they sent it to me, I was like, hmm, this looks a bit basic. But um, I had it just uh, in my Switch and kind of stumbled across it one night. Um, I've been playing a lot of Switch before bed, which I know is probably not good. Sleep hygiene, um, as they would say. But... Um, this game just seemed like uh, something that I, I thought I would try, so I gave it a try, and um, 
an hour later kind of came out of a trance. So um, it's it's a very simple game. It uses the touch screen, and um, what appears on the screen is a kind of a mess of lines with uh, dots in between them. And you have to draw with your finger and create geometric shapes that use every dot. Um, which is not as simple as it sounds. It starts off pretty simple, just like a couple of triangles. And once you're finished, it will turn into like a bow tie. And you're like, oh, it was a bow tie. I didn't realize what I was drawing. And then they get progressively more complicated. And each object that you create by finishing the puzzle, um, it's not always clear what they are, but they'll turn into things. Like they'll turn into maybe a sun or a flower or a deck chair or a crashing wave or a surfboard. And then after you've done 20 or 25 puzzles, you'll get um, a scene and you can see all of the objects that you drew in a nice, basic, um, animated kind of screen savory scene. And then you can move on to the next one, which might turn out to be like a house in a room or, you know, different scenes, circus, whatever. Um, and although it's very simple, I found this game to be a really relaxing play. Um, you don't always want to play, like I have a, a problem with um, getting stuck in games like, let's say, Death Stranding, where it's not a game that you can play casually. For a start, you have to kind of sit down on the sofa, fire up the TV, fire up the speaker, make sure the control is charged, and then focus. There's lots of controls, it's a complicated story. Um, you have to plot your map direction, you have to deal with enemies and all this kind of stuff. And I have to be in a certain mood for that kind of game. And often I just want to play something kind of simple and relaxing uh, before bed or because I'm, you know, waiting for an appointment or just taking the bus or whatever. And you've got like 20 minutes or 10 minutes or five minutes. You just want to play something quick. Um, and I was playing Bleak Sword, which was in uh, a couple of episodes ago. Um, Apple Arcade is very good for this. And one line colouring um, is absolutely perfect for this. It's a low concentration game that is nonetheless satisfying. The puzzles um, get progressively more challenging. You have to kind of really think about how you uh, join the different lines together. There are kind of one-way systems sometimes. So you have to do the puzzle in a certain way, and it might take you five or six attempts to get there. Um, and when you get there, there's like this kind of nice light reward of just seeing the whole scene. I think there are five or six different scenes that you can make, um, which means probably 50 or 60 puzzles. I haven't counted them, but that's what it looks like to the naked eye. So I enjoyed that one. I want to say thank you to Mythic Owl for sending it to me. Um, it's on the Switch. Uh, it's also on iOS. That's One Line Colouring. So... That's the show. That's four different games that I've had a great time with. Um, hope you enjoyed hearing about them. Um, I guess the other big news that happened in the last couple of weeks was the 35th anniversary Mario releases, which includes the uh, Mario All-Stars 3D, the original Mario All-Stars being on um, SNES Online for Switch owners who have the, the online subscription, um, and some other stuff like remote controlled car Mario Kart, which looks great for kids, um, and the Game & Watch Anniversary Edition, which is like a gold Game & Watch of the original couple Mario games, which is really cool. In fact, so cool that I jumped on Amazon and ordered one. They were already sold out on the nintendo.co.uk website, so I went to Amazon. Um, it's the kind of thing where I'm going to struggle to know whether I want to keep it in the box and have it on a shelf as a collector's item, or whether I want to break it out and actually play with it, because... Those games are on the Switch, so maybe it's one that I'll leave in the box this time, leave it sealed, and um, have it there on the shelf as a collector. Um, if they become super valuable and I'm a strapped for cash old person one day, maybe I'll, I'll sell the thing and be able to eat. Who knows? Um, but I was quite impressed with the, uh, the selection that are coming out. Um, I, I really I played Mario 64 and um, I liked that game. I don't think I ever finished it. I've got a memory of going quite deep into it. Um, but I'm not sure I finished it. Same with Mario Sunshine. I've I've kind of owned a lot of Mario games between Super Nintendo and GameCube. 
so I've played pretty much all of them and finished relatively few. I remember finishing Super Mario World on the original Super Nintendo because I only had three uh, games at first. All-Stars, Link to the Past, and Mario Kart, and no, four, because Super Mario World. But I did finish that one. Um, never finished Sunshine, did finish Odyssey. But because I never owned a Wii or a Wii U, I've never played the, the Mario games that were on those systems, so I've never played Super Mario Galaxy. So I'm really excited about that one. I'll definitely be downloading the Mario bundle. Um, even though, like, I, I do love Mario games, but I find them a little frustrating sometimes. Like, especially the old 2D ones where it's kind of very tight controls, tight platforming, one slip up and you die kind of thing. Um, I was playing through Mario 1 and just failing at it. <laughs> Some people in the Switch core group just flew through Mario 1 in two hours as soon as it came onto the Switch um, and just said, yeah, I just finished Mario 1. I played it for half an hour and I think I was halfway through World 2 and just dying a lot. Um, but the 3D ones I'm a little better at. Um, I really like 3D platformers in general. Um, I think the legacy of Mario 64 can still be seen today. Like we see it in games like, we saw it in games like Spyro the Dragon which is definitely a post-Mario 64 platform game, um, in Crash Bandicoot, and in, I guess, most recently, Super Lucky's Tale, which is a really nice 3D platformer that I'm kind of halfway through. Um, but I was I was uh, fine with this Mario announcement. I saw a lot of discord on Twitter from people that were disappointed or angry about all these different things like the price point or the, the r rumoured resolution of the games or the fact that Galaxy 2 isn't there. And I don't know, man. I just felt kind of sad about them. Uh, I felt sad for them. You know, we all wait for these game announcements and then when they finally arrive, it's good to just enjoy it and look forward to it and enjoy the games. I think maybe it's just gamer Twitter. There's always a lot of outrage flying around. But I'm, I don't know. I'm really happy. I'm looking forward to buying those games, and I will. So the Mario news was great. Um, and in the meantime, um, I'll be moving on to play lots more oddities and uh, Switch games. I'll be progressing in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, maybe making uh, more moves with Death Stranding if I can get in the mood for it. So I'll come back next week with um, a new podcast, some new games to talk about. Um, I hope you enjoyed listening. Please do follow me on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, Instagram. I'm on all of those platforms as Gaming in the Wild. Twitter is the main one. Um, I'll be Twitch streaming some of the games I've talked about today. So please come and follow me on Twitch and join the conversation. So thanks for listening. That's our show. Take care of yourselves and each other. Bye-bye.